Good morning, Riverside. Thank you so much for joining us for our online service. Whether you are gathering with family and friends, or maybe you're just traveling to your next destination, we're glad that you made the decision to worship with us this morning. In just a moment, our worship team is going to lead us. And before they do, I wanna share a scripture out of the book of Philippians. Therefore, God elevated Jesus to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that we can meet with you anywhere. As we call out to you, as we listen to your word here this morning, as we worship together, all in different spaces, you are with us. We are thankful for that. We are thankful, thankful for your son, Jesus. And here this morning, we celebrate him. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hello, Riverside. I hope that you all had a wonderful Christmas and that you are celebrating Jesus today somewhere with some people that you are close to, that you love, perhaps it's your family or your friends, and we're so excited to be able to share with you today from God's Word. If you are watching with us for the very first time, I also want to invite you to join us uh, this coming Sunday. We're gonna be beginning 2022 at 10 a.m. at both of our campuses, and we want you to be a part of the Riverside family. Uh, as we have prepared for our time together today, uh, I've been thinking over the last several weeks about this Christmas tree. That's the series that we find ourselves in right now. And several weeks ago, uh, we were out in Missouri to celebrate with Amy's family over the Thanksgiving holiday. And while we were there, we celebrated her dad's 80th birthday as well. And you can see some pictures from those experiences that we had. It was a great time of reconnecting uh, with her family. For some, it had not uh, been an opportunity for us to get together for a couple of years, so that was really special. And while we were there, uh, I've seen this uh, picture that we're gonna show you on the screen for years when we've gone to visit. It's a picture of Amy's parents' family tree. And as we were preparing for this series of the Christmas tree, I couldn't help but think of this picture that's in her family's house. And considering the series that we're in, it was of special significance to me as I was thinking about the genealogy of her family as I have been of my own. So in our time together today, we return for this final message in the Christmas tree. And we've been focusing, if you're brand new with us today, on the lineage of Jesus from the perspective of Matthew's gospel primarily, as well as a bit of Luke's story. And as I was thinking about our final message this morning, I was thinking about broken branches. And uh, I don't know if you've ever had a Christmas tree that had broken branches, but uh, that actually happened to Amy and I many years ago. We had one of those trees. We've always had artificial trees. Uh, and we had the, the top piece of the tree uh, was broken and it was leaning. And the only way that we could get it to stand up straight was to use a piece of rope uh, and tie it to some of the lower branches because we didn't have time uh, to be able to run out and get another Christmas tree. And so we tied it with rope on the back side, and we got through that Christmas year until we could get something new for the next year. I'm wondering, again, have you ever had the branches on your Christmas tree break? And if you have, you know that you don't wanna put those broken branches out in the front. You wanna turn it around as much as you possibly can so that the, the broken branches, they're on the backside where nobody actually has to look at them. And one of the things we've been telling you in this series is that through the genealogies, though they may seem boring to you when you're reading them, there's so much depth and there's so much about God and who God is in these stories that come from just a list of names. And God is not ashamed of any of the genealogy of his son, Jesus. And so he includes the good, the bad, and the ugly in those accounts from Matthew and from Luke. And in our time together today, I want us to look at two of the broken branches. And in doing so, we're going to be reminded of some simple yet deeply meaningful truths about who God is from these two broken branches of the Christmas tree. They're actually from Israel's cursed king and Israel's worst king. So if you have your app notes, I wanna encourage you to open up your Riverside app and you can go to the tab for today and follow along because we wanna show you some things that will hope to be encouraging and be helpful and add value to your experience as you consider and celebrate Jesus over this Christmas holiday. So first of all, from the story of the cursed king, we are encouraged to remember that God keeps his promises. Almost 2,100 years before Jesus was born, all the way back in Genesis chapter 17, God made a promise to Abraham. And actually, Abraham was 99 years old when this promise came from God. And the promise was that all nations would be blessed through him. 
And then roughly about a thousand years later, God promised David, King David, that his throne would be established forever. And if you've been with us these last several months for the story, you know we talked a bit about that. Here's a recap of the promise that God gave to David. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16. God says this, he says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And we know that this promise was fulfilled through David's son, Solomon. You can read all about that in 1 Kings chapter 1 and chapter 2, which brings us to the Christmas tree. Did you know that there are two different genealogies in Scripture for a very specific purpose? God leaves nothing to chance and he leaves no detail left out. And these two genealogical records, uh, these Christmas trees, if you will, from Matthew and from Luke are there for a very, very, very specific purpose. As we've been telling you, Matthew's genealogy is from David through Solomon, and eventually it goes down through Joseph. Look at what Matthew records in chapter one. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it goes all the way down until it reaches this line. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So you'll see there that one of the grandpas, if you will, one of the grandfathers of Jesus was a man by the name of Jacob, and he's the father of Joseph. So that's the line from Matthew's perspective of David all the way down through Solomon and eventually to Jacob and to Joseph. Luke's genealogy is also from David, but his genealogy takes it from David through David's son, Nathan, and eventually down through Mary. Look at it in Luke chapter three and verse 23. It says there, Jesus was known as the son of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Heli. So the grandfather of Jesus on Mary's side was Heli. And so you see these two very different genealogies and they look considerably different. And you wonder, it says Joseph was the son of Heli. Well, how could it be the son of Heli and the son of Jacob over in <clears throat> Matthew's account, well, it's just, just like me or just like you. If you're married, you have, um, I, I'm the son of Larry and Leona and I'm the son of Bill and Connie. And so I relate to both of my sets of my in-laws and my parents um, the same way. And so that's exactly what's happening here through Joseph and through Mary. In your app notes, and we'll put it up on the screen here as you're watching this morning, you're gonna see these two genealogies from Matthew and from Luke. And you'll notice that Matthew's is shorter than Luke's because Matthew, he's trying to connect Jesus as the Messiah. So for the Hebrew perspective, for the Jewish people, he's going back to Abraham. Luke, on the other hand, he's writing to a much broader audience, an entire Gentile world, and he wants to connect Jesus all the way back to Adam. And so you can get lost in all of those details. <clears throat> but what I wanna do is I wanna show you a picture that is a little bit more simplified. So take a look at it in your notes and we'll put it up on the screen as well. I call it the Christmas tree. Why would God need to include two different genealogies in Jesus' ancestry? And the reason is a very practical reason. And, the, and that is, is because the Hebrews would have been fact checking on his claim to be the Messiah. And the answer to that question of why there's two different genealogies and the significance of that is actually found in the prophetic book of Jeremiah. It's roughly about 600 years before Mary and Joseph are even born. Je Jeremiah prophesied, about a king named Jeconiah or Jehoachin. <clears throat> he goes by both of those names, Jehoachin or Jeconiah. And God said that none of his descendants would sit on the throne. God says that because of his father's wickedness, as well as his own wickedness, that no one else would be king in their family line. Here it is from Jeremiah chapter 22. I want you to see this. God says this, as surely as I live, says the Lord, I will abandon you, Jehoachin, or again, Jeconiah, he goes by both of those names. I will abandon you, king of Judah. I will hand you over to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and the mighty Babylonian army. 
I will expel you and your mother from this land and you will die in a foreign country, not in your native land. You will never again return to the land you yearn for. This is what the Lord says. Let the record show that this man Jehoiachin was childless. He is a failure. Notice that phrase, he is a failure for none of his children will succeed him on the throne of David to rule over Judah. Now we know that he actually had children, but none of them, as it says there, were going to succeed him in the Davidic line and in the kingship. So what? Okay, David, so what? <clears throat> well, remember, this first big idea that we're trying to drive home from today's Christmas tree, this broken branch, is that God keeps his promises. So keep all of that in mind, because then over in Matthew's gospel, we, we read this line in the Christmas tree coming from David through Solomon, Matthew chapter one and verse 11. Josiah, the father of Jeconiah or Jehoiachin and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Again, we read over that so quickly, doesn't mean much to us, but when you see it in context, something amazing is happening here. It's important to note that based on what Matthew tells us, had there been a legitimate king in Israel at the time of Jesus, Joseph would have been right there in the palace. But the kingship fell apart when Jeconiah or Jehoiachin and some of the Israelites were deported into Babylon on, history tells us it happened on March the 16th, 597 BC. So the prophecy in Jeremiah tells us that though Joseph had the legal right to the throne, he could not be king because of the curse that God had spoken over that specific line from David through Solomon all the way down to Jehoiachin. That line was now cursed in the Christmas tree. 14 generations later, Joseph is just a stonemason He's a carpenter, even though he's from the royal house of David. But don't despair, because Mary's line also had the needed royal blood for the Messiah. If Jesus had been born to Mary with no connection to Joseph, he would have not had any right to the throne because Mary's line was not the royal line. She was from David's son, Nathan and his line. You can read it right there in the, in the text in Luke's gospel. She had royal blood, but she was not an heir to the throne. And I wanna take just a quick moment, pause on what we're doing here with the Christmas tree because I want you to see something that is so beautiful. And again, if you don't see the whole picture and the whole story, you can miss what's going on here. Did you notice Mary's line is through her son or through David's son, Nathan. Nathan was the name of the man, the prophet who had come to David when he had um, committed adultery with Bathsheba, when he had murdered Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. We've talked about that over these last several weeks. Here's what I want you to see. Eventually, the texts in the Hebrew scriptures tell us that Bathsheba and David had several children, one of whom was Solomon, but another one was named David. Can you get the picture of this? The very man who had confronted David about his sin, David eventually names one of his sons after this prophet who had spoken into his life so that the Holy Spirit would bring conviction, so that David could confess his sin, that he could repent and experience the grace of God, and then he names one of his very own sons after this man who had confronted him. I don't know about you, but I absolutely love that. It reminds me of the grace and the mercy that we see embedded into the Christmas tree. So Mary's line through Nathan. Remember, Joseph was not the natural father of Jesus. He simply adopted him, if you will. But when Joseph adopts Jesus, so to speak, into his family, Jesus becomes the firstborn son. And with that, he has all of the rights and all of the responsibilities. And because Joseph had the legal right to the throne, Jesus, as the firstborn, has that right. 
However, through Mary, he has the bloodline to the throne. So Jesus has the lineage through Mary and the legal right through Joseph. This is one of the most amazing facets of the Christmas story. And it's right there and we skip over it so quickly. The Christmas tree that God has embedded right there in Matthew and in Luke, God specifically chose Mary and Joseph to be the Messiah's parents for those very reasons. If that weren't all amazing enough, what does this demonstrate to us about God, about our Heavenly Father? And again, you know what's coming. God keeps his promises, but he doesn't just keep his promises. He always keeps his promises. There was no hope, absolutely no hope, based on the curse that God had spoken for Jeconiah's line, but God worked in spite of the curse. And no matter what the circumstances or what people may tell you today right now in your life, God is in control. Just when it seems as if everything is hopeless and that there's nothing that can be done, God miraculously steps in. He can reach the cursed and the worst among us. No one is out of his reach. No matter how things look, no matter how bad things look, no matter how bleak your situation might be today, right there as you're sitting and experiencing God's word for yourself, he is working. And it can look ruined and it can look lost, but he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. So as we look at this first broken branch from today, this cursed king, be reminded, God always keeps his promises. There's a second reminder that the Christmas tree uh, offers us on this day after celebrating the birth of Emmanuel, the God who is with us. And it's actually from Israel's worst king. And again, we can skip by this so quickly, but let's look at this second broken branch. The man's name is Manasseh. And here's where his name appears in the line in Matthew's account. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. That's in chapter 1 and verse 10. Here's the reminder that this broken branch offers us from the Christmas tree today, that God can rise above failure. So simple. And yet, as we read this, as we see this, so profound. Manasseh became king at the age of 12, and he was Israel's most wicked king. He reigned, the text tells us, for 55 years. And for the sake of time, I just want to summarize what the Hebrew scriptures uh, describe about his life. Manasseh, it says, he did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed detestable practices by worshiping idols, practicing sorcery, divination, and witchcraft. He consulted mediums and psychics, and he desecrated the temple, and he even, this is just so unbelievable, he even sacrificed his own children in the fires of the pagan gods. The text tells us that he led the people of Israel to do more evil than all the pagan nations around them. He even shed so much innocent blood that the text says he filled Jerusalem from end to end. And extra biblical sources, tradition tells us that he even had the prophet Isaiah sawed in half. Well, as you might expect, that can't go on forever when it comes to God. And there came a time of reckoning for both him and the people of Israel. Second Chronicles chapter 33 tells us this. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles and took him to Babylon. In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. 
It goes on to say that he got rid of the foreign gods and removed the image from the temple of the Lord, as well as all the altars he had built up on the temple hill and in Jerusalem. He threw them out of the city. Then he restored the altar of the Lord and sacrificed fellowship offerings and thank offerings on it. And he told Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. <laughs> You read that, and it, 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 isn't it just amazing? I mean, what a miraculous turnaround story. And with stories like that, I mean, they may be very hard. When you read about and you see all that I'd said there, they may be very hard for us to get a hold of and fully fathom. But stories like that give me hope. And I hope Manasseh's story gives you hope today as well. What does Manasseh's story in the Christmas tree tell us ultimately about God. And if you're catching on, you know what's coming. God can rise above failure. He was able to rise above Manasseh's failure all those years ago, and he can rise above ours today as well. You read all of this and you can quickly and easily skip over the genealogies, if you wish. But if you ever feel like a broken branch, I wanna encourage you today. I'm encouraging myself as well. Don't miss the message of grace that we find in this list of names. Remember, and I love this about Jesus, one of the charges at Jesus' trial was that he was a friend of sinners. He is your friend. He cares about you and what promises he has given you in his word, he will keep. Whatever failure you have in your life today, he can forgive if you will acknowledge them, if you will reach out to them, if you will turn away from the failure and toward him. He is a God who is full of grace, who is full of of mercy. So don't miss the grace of the Christmas tree this year. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are encouraged today by these profound reminders. You keep your promises and you rise above failure. May we live in light of these truths and may we not just hold on to them for ourselves, but may we pass them along to others. And may we be transformed by your amazing grace this day. It's in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that we pray together. Amen and amen.
presence is peace The word spoke into darkness Bringing light to all I hope you are encouraged to know that you serve and worship a king who reigns forevermore, who will reign forevermore. And I pray and hope that you are blessed by being a part of today's online experience. And we look forward to next week, this upcoming Sunday, January 2nd, a unique experience. We're not meeting at our typical 9 and 11 a.m. times. We have one service at both locations at 10 a.m. and we can't wait to see you there. And of course, this week, we wanna encourage you to continue to stay rooted in God's word, reading your Bibles. And so we wanna invite you to join us in reading the YouVersion Bible reading plan, Christmas Promises Fulfilled, and pray that it'll be a real blessing to your life. And so as we prepare to go on for the rest of our week and into the rest of our week, we want to invite you to give and to continue to return your tithes 
and offerings to God. And if you wanna know how you can give, you can download the Riverside Community Church app, look at the giving tab there. You can open up your sermon app notes and see that there's a uh, giving instructions in there as well as text to give. And so we are praying for you and hope that you have a wonderful New Year's. We cannot wait to see you this coming Sunday. We love you.